Good evening. Welcome to the League of Women Voters Candidate Forum for the Colorado House of Representatives for Districts 52 and 53 and 65. <clears throat> I'm Ruth Long with the League of Women Voters. I will be your moderator this evening. The League of Women Voters is a political but nonpartisan organization. We support issues but not candidates, and we work to register, educate, and inform voters in order to make democracy work. This forum will be shown on Comcast channels 14 and 881 and Connection channel 14. It will be live streamed on www.fcgov.com slash fctv and recorded for later viewing. The video will be on the League of Women Voters of Larimer County website and the League of Women Voters Vote411.org for on-demand viewing. I will very quickly review the format for tonight's forum. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to introduce themselves, tell us why they're running for office, and what skills and experiences they bring to the position. The candidates will then have one minute to answer questions posed by me. And at the end of the forum, each candidate will have one minute to make a closing statement. <clears throat> Our timer tonight is Jory Kramer. She will keep us on schedule. We also have league volunteers sorting questions and greeting the audience. Uh, one note, I've, uh, there will be no recording, so please do, uh, in the audience, would prefer no recording. <clears throat> so let's begin with candidate introductions. Um, the first person is uh, Kathy Kipp, who is running for uh, congressional, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> State House District 52. Kathy? Um, thank you so much, and thank you for hosting the forum to the League of Women Voters. We really appreciate how you continue to educate voters every single year. Um, so I'm State Representative Kathy Kipp. I have served um, in this seat for the last four years in the House. Before that, I served for seven years on the Poudre School District Board of Education. Um, and I come to this role kind of, you know, by the family route. I have twins that are 24 years old now. So when I was that always that parent at school who was there saying, I need to volunteer, I need to be there. I served on pretty much every district committee. And when I was on the school board, I finally decided, you know what, we need to fund our schools better in Colorado. And the way to do it is to have a vote down at the state capitol, because that's where a lot of these decisions to get made. So that's why I wanted to be in the state legislature. Um, I've lived in Fort Collins for 37 years, um, been married to my husband, Don, for nearly that long. Um, I've been, um, I, one of the things I did when I got onto the school board is I started listening sessions because I really believe that we need to listen to the people who we represent. So I've been doing really monthly listening sessions since I got on the school board back in 2011 and um, just been doing that ever since. We continue to do listening sessions, town halls, et cetera. I would really appreciate um, you all listening in tonight and look forward to hopefully earning your vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Didi Vicino is the uh, second candidate for House District 52. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here, and thank you, League of Women Voters, for hosting this event and giving us an opportunity to speak tonight. I am running for office because I am, I love Colorado. I love living here. I love everything about our state, and I want to make sure that we protect and preserve the quality of life that we have here as Coloradans. Um, I want to make sure that our citizens are free to walk the streets without worry. I want to make sure that we have a safe and secure community for everyone. We need to really get a handle on crime, prosecute criminals, and protect our citizens. I want to make sure that we are free from taxes and fees so that life here is affordable and everyone can afford to put gas in the car, food on their table. 
and afford uh, housing here in Fort Collins. I want to make sure that small businesses have the freedom to operate free from government over regulation and oversight so that we can encourage our small business community to thrive and grow. And I want to make sure that parents retain the right to decide how and where their children are educated. As a former teacher and principal of a high-performing charter school that served 15 over 1,500 socioeconomically disadvantaged children, ethnically diverse population, I think that I'm positioned well to look at policy and legislature. Also, I've written policy for international organizations in developing countries, so I understand <clears throat> what poorly thought out policy can do to our citizens. Thank you again so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Lisa Chalet is um, the candidate for House District 65. Hi, my name is Lisa Cholet, and I am a Colorado native. I've lived in Northern Colorado since 2006. I'm a happily, happily married mother of five, grandmother of one. Um, and I'm running to bring a real voice and representation for our working families. I am a working family. My children have decided to become teachers. And I see the struggles, and I live the struggles of affordability and inability to make good choices without having to consider finances. I think it's important that we have a real voice down in the capital for Northern Colorado and the smaller com communities that surround Fort Collins and Windsor. And I, as a planning commissioner in the town of Wellington, champion and director of Safe Routes to School, and a board uh, member for the Budget Advisory Committee for PSD, I think that I'm in touch with what is affecting the families within our district. And I think I'm the right person to bring that voice and that concern and common sense solutions and get back to governance and not politicking in our state capital and start making decisions that are good for everyone instead of just a few. I think that my ability to work across party lines like I do in Wellington puts me in a position to get things done. Thank you. Okay. And the next candidate for House District 65 is Mike Lynch. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you once again for uh, sponsoring us and, and getting, getting folks out here so they can take a look at candidates. Uh, my name is Mike Lynch. I currently am the representative for House District 49. And after uh, redistricting, that turned into House District 65. Uh, I'm a Colorado native. Uh, been here uh, most of my life. Uh, sometimes when I was uh, in the military, I went off to uh, the military academy at West Point and came back and served in Fort Carson um, and started a family here. Uh, I have a, a wife who's, um, who's on her way from a soccer game for my son, um, and it's also my wedding anniversary, so this is the best way to spend that. Uh, uh, so we're hoping something's open a little later. But um, I, I ran for office because, you know, I wasn't particularly happy with what was going on uh, down at the Capitol. And, and, you know, after a certain amount of complaining about what's going on, you, you've got to put that into action. And so um, I was fortunate enough to, to be in a position where I was able to, to run for office. I, I run my own business. I have 13 employees, so I've signed both sides of a paycheck. Um, and I take that experience down to the Capitol every day. Um, through that, I am I serve on the Judicial Committee, and, and after one session, I'm also the ranking member on the Business Committee, and uh, would appreciate your support and look forward to talking to you after this. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> um, our next candidate is for House District 53. Andrew Basenecker is able to be with us, and I need to inform you that uh, Donna Walter is not able to be with us, and our policy is that the uh, candidate uh, who is, doesn't have an opponent uh, will be able to introduce himself and uh, won't be able to answer your questions, unfortunately. So, uh, Andrew. Well, thank you, Ruth, and uh, thank you to the League for hosting the event this evening. Good evening, my name is State Representative Andrew Basenecker, and I have the distinct privilege of working on behalf of House District 53 and our community down at the State Capitol. You know, I'm running for re-election because I believe that together we can build a future full of hope, equity, and opportunity for each and every Coloradan. 
Now, this commitment to my community is one that I feel that I've demonstrated over the last year and a half serving our community at the state capitol. I've fought hard for affordable and attainable housing in our community, standing alongside mobile home park residents and working to ensure that our state's largest source of unsubsidized affordable housing remains just that. I've also championed policies that protect our land, air, and water, ensuring that we can build more recreational trails here in the state of Colorado, while conducting a comprehensive audit of the oil and gas industry in our state. I also stand alongside our school children and our public school teachers as a former public school teacher myself. And I believe that we must continue to work to fully fund our students and our educators so that every student has the tools they need to succeed and that every educator in our state is paid a competitive salary. Last but not least, I'd like to highlight the issue of abortion and just mention that I will always fight for the right to choose and believe that abortion must remain safe and legal in our state. I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you, with you this evening. I'm sorry I can't answer the questions on behalf of the league, but I look forward to engaging after the session. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and start with our questions. And um, let's start with Dee Dee, uh, since we, uh, Kathy started with the introduction. So we'll start with Dee Dee. Uh, <clears throat> this question is about health care. What measures would you support to address health care access and affordability in the state, especially in rural areas? Health care is an important issue. Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, it's something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, small business owners who own their own businesses struggle with this issue. I'm a small business owner because then you have to figure out how to find health care for yourself and your family if you're not part of a larger group. So I appreciate that. I really am a fan of direct primary care. I think that operating the clinics and well, the clinics and facilities throughout the state in rural Colorado, if we can find a way to bring direct primary care to rural areas, that would really help solve a lot of problems. Direct primary care can be provided for a very low fee. Um, we've got several clinics right here in Fort Collins that charge a subscription rate of $50, $75 a piece, which is fairly affordable. It all kind of gets back to affordability. We want to make sure that we make things affordable for all Coloradans, and that is my goal, to reduce taxes, fees, and regulations so that we can provide that kind of care to our citizens. Thank you. Lisa. Um, thank you for the question. It, this is actually um, a subject that's close to me, um, living in Wellington. And being someone that has um, rheumatoid arthritis, the struggle for affordable health care is real. So um, I will first give you an example. When my husband got laid off because of COVID, I went from having a $35 copay for my monthly medicine to a $7,000 bill for that same life-sustaining medicine. I think it's very important that we expand health care access, make buy-in a lower price, start regulating more common prescription drugs besides insulin, providing avenues for people in rural areas to have things like emergency medicine and bring policies that would encourage doctors in these bigger cities to spend more time out in the rural areas where it's desperately needed. And Mike. Thank you. Uh, you know, we've made a number of efforts down at the state capitol to, to fix this problem. And, and, you know, a lot of times the idea is just throw more money at it. Um, what what really has become the issue is that uh, we have, through policies in this state, choked out all of the businesses in those rural areas that were uh, providing good jobs, providing good benefits um, to those folks, and, and that we've seen that go away. Um, I've seen even in Wellington, we no longer have an ambulance service anymore. Uh, we now have to, uh, you know, our response times have been incredibly diminished. Um, I don't think throwing more money at this issue is necessarily going to be the answer. I think it's reducing the burdens on those companies that that used to provide uh, great health care to folks. Uh, that is the case in my business. Uh, once uh, once the regulation got in the middle of it, we said we couldn't offer benefits anymore. So uh, reduce regulations, and I think we'll increase our affordable health care. Okay, and Kathy. Um, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I, as I said, I've been in the House since 2019, and we've really tried to make a lot of um, changes to improve health care affordability since I've been there. Um, we did pass the reinsurance plan, which takes some of those really high-cost individuals out of the insurance pool so that they are not raising the rates for everybody else. 
We have um, worked, We last year we did the Colorado option. Really a lot of the, where the cost ends up is in those middlemen, um, insurance, um, hospitals. We've um, done work on um, pharmaceuticals and lowering the price of drugs, importing them from Canada and other places. Um, I want to mention too, though, behavioral health. That's a really huge um, need that we have in our state. So we have behavioral health where we, um, for, that's mental health and substance abuse. And that's one of the really big areas that we have put some of that once in a lifetime transformational money that's come into our state government um, from the federal pandemic funding into over the last um, this year. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a couple of other questions on the theme of health. And <clears throat> we'll uh, start with Lisa this time. Um, <clears throat> what suggestions do you have for addressing the fentanyl death rates in Colorado? Um, that is a good question. And again, you keep hitting on things that hit close to home. My best friend's niece just passed away from a fentanyl overdose a couple weeks ago. Um, I think the fentanyl bill that was passed um, took a big step forward in that. I think that we need to start addressing the actual cause of the problem, which I understand suppliers and all of that is a problem, but the users who's choosing to use illicit drugs to escape the things that are bothering them in their life, because that is what drug abuse is about, we need to start addressing those issues. We also need to shore up our criminal justice system in the way that we provide re rehabilitation and set people up for success when they get out of the criminal justice system. And I think a lot of education around that with some safeguards to start saving some lives right now is super important. Mike. Thank you. Um, so the bill she's talking about was my bill. Uh, I originated the fentanyl le legislation down at the Capitol this year, uh, stayed with that bill, and boy, I can tell you more about fentanyl than you want to know. But I will say um, I eventually got off of that bill because it didn't do enough. Um, it, it, it moves some stuff forward as far as our ability to prosecute distribution and manufacture, but it doesn't do anything for users. The real problem in this state is a law that we passed in 2019 that made it legal for you to have four grams of any illicit substance. Well, we did that before the, the real rise of fentanyl coming into this state. Uh, now we have fentanyl, and you're still it's still somewhat legal for you to have those four grams. If you simply say you don't didn't know you had it, then you get away with, with the crime. But four grams of fentanyl will kill up to 2,000 people. Um, what we need to do to fix this is to continue to crack down on um, uh, the, the folks that are, it, we, we, we need to get behind law enforcement, which is not able to, to currently enforce laws. Okay, Kathy. Um, thank you so much. So yeah, I mean, as I mentioned um, at the end of my last answer, we really put a lot of money in the state and a lot of that was that federal pandemic money that came in into um, substance abuse, um, which fentanyl falls into that category. Um, I, I did support the fentanyl bill that we passed this year. Um, it had some really good things in it, like um, testing. We want to make sure that if people are going to use illicit drugs, that they can at least make sure that their illicit drugs aren't laced with a poison that can kill them. Because, yeah, people do stupid stuff, but it shouldn't kill them. Um, substance abuse treatment is something else we put a lot of money into because if we don't deal with substance abuse treatment, we're not going to get to where we need to be. And frankly, the prisons and the jails are not the appropriate warehouse to put people who suffer from substance abuse addictions into those places. We need to make sure that we are addressing the problem at its root and keeping people safe. Thank you. Dee Dee. <coughs> Thank you so much. Um, this is a, a pretty personal issue for me. I'm a mom of four, um, two I gave birth to, two I acquired. One is still in high school. She's in our local public school and kids do dumb things. And fortunately, our child has not done dumb things, but I'm afraid that maybe one of her friends will make a really poor choice and may end up dying in the next year or two because of the fentanyl issue that we have in our country. My cousin right now is serving time in prison for possession with intent to steal, to instant, intent to distribute fentanyl. And I'm thankful that she's there because she can participate in the medical assistant treatment program and she can participate in the work release program and gain the skills that she will need to support her family when she is released in the next couple of years. So I am grateful that she is there. 
um, one milligram of fentanyl can kill 500 people. Bills like the one my opponent passed are killing our kids. We revisited it. That's good. We reduced it. We're down to one milligram. That is not enough. We have to be tough on crime. We have to be tough on fentanyl. We have to prosecute people with intent to distribute so that we can protect our children. This is not okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dee Dee. Uh, <clears throat> this next question, um, we'll start with Mike. Um, <clears throat> please explain if and how you would support and protect women's health care and reproductive rights in Colorado. Well, we had quite a bit of discussion about that this last year. Um, and I, I think, you know, the two issues of abortion and uh, health care have kind of got mixed together. So, you know, there, there is a way um, to support women's health care and support them through uh, a healthy pregnancy uh, and, and educate them on, on the different options that are available to them. Um, granted, you know, if, if there's risk to their life, um, that's, a different, that's a different issue. But um, I, I believe, you know, what we did in this state uh, truly uh, is the most extreme example that we can see in the, in the nation about um, the ability for a, a woman to make a choice. And it, it came without compromise. And that's the part that bums me out about how that legislation went down. Thank you. Kathy. Um, thank you. And I would invite the audience to go read that bill because it's a very simple bill that basically says people get to do what they want with their own bodies. Right. It's not uh, an extreme bill in any sense. And the voters in Colorado have spoken over and over again, most recently in 2020, to say that they believe that women should have, all people should have the right to have an abortion and to do what they will with their own bodies. Abortion care is health care. I'm just going to repeat that because that's just so incredibly important. Abortion care is health care. Women's lives are being put at risk across this country because extremist governments are going and taking away the right for people to do what they need to do with their own bodies. Those decisions should not be subject to governmental intervention, period. That's what I support, and that's the bill I supported as well this last session. Thanks. Dee Dee. Thank you so much for the question. Um, reproductive health care. I support reproductive health care. I support reproductive health care for women and for men because reproductive health care is about fertility and making sure that we continue to procreate, procreate and continue the human race. So yeah, I'm a fan of that. What we're talking about is not reproductive health care. However, what we are talking about is abortion. And we did pass one of the most extreme abortion laws this country has ever seen. It's codified in our constitution. We need to move forward from that. I think we need to focus on prevention. If we can prevent people from having unexpected and maybe unwanted pregnancies, that would be key. We do that through education. Abstinence is the number one, to pre one, number one way to prevent pregnancies. And it is now, because of legislation that's recently been passed, forbidden to be spoken about within schools. We need to bring the conversation of abstinence back. We need to celebrate women, encourage them, and give them the support they need if they find themselves with an unexpected pregnancy. We also need to celebrate fathers, and we need to uplift fathers, and we need to give them those services and support and tools and resources they need to be good fathers to their children. We need to support women. Thank you. Thank you. And Lisa. So as a mother of five children, <clears throat> abstinence doesn't work very well in marriage. I've had one child that was planned. I did have to terminate a pregnancy at 23 weeks to save my own life. It never occurred to me that someone would call that abortion. It was the single worst day of my life. With that said, I think um, my opponent said something that really resonates with me, actually, because he is my representative as well. Um, is that the role of government should never have anything to do with what we do with our own person. Whether that's a vaccine you don't like or a vaccine you do like, or your choice with what you want to do with your body as a person who is pregnant. I will stand up for that right every day and all day. It doesn't mean that I am 
pro-abortion, I'm pro-choice for each and every individual to make the choice that's best for them and for their family. Okay, very good. <clears throat> this next question also deals with um, health care. It's on gun safety. And let's see, I think we would be starting with Kathy again. Please explain whether or not you believe additional gun safety laws and funding are needed in Colorado. Yes, um, I do. Um, so since I have been in the state legislature in 2019, we passed the red flag law. Um, in this last year, well, not this year, but the year before in 2021, following the Boulder shooting, we passed a number of other laws such as safe storage and expanding background checks, closing the boyfriend loophole, um, making sure people report lost and stolen firearms. We also created the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. The Office of Gun Violence Prevention is out there to make sure that we as a state are looking to improve our gun safety in Colorado. And I look forward to seeing recommendations from their office and from um, my colleagues in the legislature to take further steps to protect Coloradans. We've had enough deaths and mass shootings in Colorado. We've had enough accidental shootings in Colorado. We need to make our state a safer place to live. Okay, Dee Dee. Thank you for the question. As a mom um, with kids running around all over this state, uh, the issue of crime and guns is, is a serious one. And I agree that we need to get a handle on crime in this state. It is absolutely a problem. And thanks to bills that my opponent voted for, the crime rates have been skyrocketing. It's really disturbing. We have got to get a handle on crime. We've got to be tough on crime. Part of that does involve gun laws and, and dealing with the guns in our state. When it comes to guns in our state, I believe that we need to enforce the safe storage laws that we have on the book. We absolutely need to enforce the very strict lo gun laws that we have here in Colorado. And in order to do that, we just, it's disturbing to me. I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought because I keep thinking of my kids out there and all of this crime. We need to protect our quality of life. We need to prosecute criminals. We need to follow the law and the rules that are already on the books. If we do that, we can really help Coloradans. Thank you. Lisa. So somehow I knew this question would come up. So I live in Wellington. It's a cross between rural and new urban. And I am fortunate enough to be friends with a former Marine who is a trustee in our town, who is a proud gun owner. And we have had many, many discussions about this. And what I think we need to do is start putting some common sense towards it. Everybody backs in their corners when you talk about gun control and gun violence. And ultimately, like some of the solutions that he and I came up with were they should be licensed. We have to license our cars. We have to be accountable for those. We should be accountable for our guns. But more importantly, we need to have safety and training, safety and training for first time gun owners. Right now I can walk down to Walmart, buy a gun and they'd let me leave not knowing I've never held a gun in my life. And I'm not anti-gun, I'm just anti-partisan solutions. I wanna see common sense people come to the table. Let's find something that keeps everyone safe. Mike. Thank you for that question. You, you know, you, the question was, do we need additional gun laws? And I think uh, that, that's definitely a, a, a no-go because uh, we see these crimes, Boulder happened in a gun-free zone. So they, they made that a, a, an area where you're not allowed to bring weapons and, and look what happened. We don't have a gun problem. We have a mental health problem in this state. We have a mental health problem with a generation. Um, I grew up with a gun and the gun rack in the back of my truck shooting gophers on the way to school and nobody ever, nobody ever had a school shooting go on. Uh, we, need to, we need to fix this issue at its root cause and it's not by controlling guns, it's by getting our good families back together where we can uh, sit around the dinner table and, and discuss what we do uh, with our time and with our, with our guns. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to follow along with that question with an, another question about crime. And let's see, we'll be starting with Dee Dee this time. What would you do to address trends in crime rates and car thefts? Transient? Trends. 
trends. To, to address the trends, current trends. A little confused about transient. <laughs> <laughs> the trends in car theft. Yes, and crime rates. And crime rates. Again, we, ha we have to prosecute crime. We have to prosecute criminals. We have been soft on crime. Bills that have been passed by our legislators have led us to soft on crime bills. We have a revolving door of criminals. Criminals are in jail and then they are out of jail before the paperwork is even processed. I have talked to people in the sheriff's department and the police department and they are so frustrated that they cannot keep dangerous people behind bars. It's gotten so bad, in fact, that progressive insurance is now refusing, refusing to insure automobiles in Denver because the crime rate is so high. What does that do to our citizens? How does that keep us safe? If we can't get car insurance, that's an even bigger problem. What happens if you're in a car accident? What if something happens to you? What if somebody hits you? We ask, if, if we are not tough on crime, the crime will continue to es es exacerbate. It will continue to grow. Our children will be victims. We will be victims, and that is not okay. We have to prosecute crime, protect our quality of life here in Colorado. That is the goal. Thank you. Lisa. So I'll agree that the criminal justice system needs to be revamped. Um, this is a subject I'm very passionate about. Um, right now, our criminal, criminal justice system houses people, turns them back out, and expects them to do different with no new tools, no rehabilitation, nothing. People go in criminals, when they come out, they've served their time, and they should be allowed and encouraged to try a different path. That isn't happening right now. Recidivism rate is sky high. That isn't a problem with the legislator level. That isn't a problem with our law enforcement. That's a problem with what happens behind the Department of Corrections. Um, it's something that I want to change. I think it's important to understand that criminal behavior be is from other issues and we need to start addressing those other issues before people are put back out into our society and take the burden off the society and put it back on the people who have committed the crimes. And Mike. Thank you. So we're seeing a big conglomeration of issues here that started all the way back to when we legalized marijuana and we decided that it'd be cool for us to, to take it easy on drug use. And then we decided that maybe we should uh, take dip, um, immunity away from our police officers um, and then we wonder why we wake up and we suddenly have uh, crime waves. Not to mention, while the crime is up, I mean, fentanyl use will be up 300% this year alone. Year to date, it's already up that much. But yet our prisons are 15% less occupied than they were before. So um, it, it's going to take an effort, um, and, and I see a lot of these issues on the Judicial Committee, to to correct, be big folks down at the Capitol and say, you know what, we screwed up. We need to maybe go back and relook at some of the things that we've done. It's time for us to look in the mirror and go, maybe that wasn't the best solution. We can do better. Okay, and Kathy. Um, thank you. So, well, first, um, thank you to um, Lisa for talking about the Department of Corrections and that we do need to do more. We um, actually have... Um, people who are working on those issues, have been working on those issues, because again, as I said earlier, prisons should not be warehouses for people who have mental and substance abuse issues. That's just not the appropriate way to get people treated and helped. Um, I would invite you to go look at District Attorney McLaughlin's new dashboard, where he actually shows that we've had decreases in crime rates in um, recently. So this is a brand new dashboard that he's got out. It's really got interesting information. So please go take a look at that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the catalytic converter theft because I think that's probably one of the things the question is an, um, asking for. We did just this last legislative session pass three bills to work on addressing the issue of catalytic converter theft. So nobody's letting these issues just drop and go away and we do want to make our community safer. Okay. And Dee Dee. I answered the question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'd like to explore the um, criminal justice system a little bit more with some additional questions. And we're going to start this time with Lisa. 
What changes would you like to see to improve the criminal justice system? Well, I would like to see, I'm going to speak specifically to the Department of Corrections. That's where you're going to see your people that are committing felonies, not in your county jails or your city jails. In um, the Department of Corrections, what I would like to see actually is something where um, you're actually giving the offenders that are in there a sense of control and hope. And I know that sounds a little crazy, but if you actually give measurable goals for how people will be released early from prison on mandatory parole, rather than subjective goals that um, are subject, subject to the bias of the parole board member that's making that decision, then offenders will be more motivated to get GEDs, learn a new skill, and things of that nature so that they, when they go in front of that parole board, they've met the measurable goals that allow them to be released and will have new skills to perhaps take a different path when they get out. And Mike. Well, this is, once again, kind of a complicated issue. Um, the criminal justice system, what, what we've tried to do in this state is say, you know, let's rehab these folks, let's get them fixed up. And, and there's a lot of merit to that. I'll give credit to that. But unfortunately, what we did is we, we jumped to a stage where we're giving them the reward before they have done, done the work. Very similar to what you were saying. Um, the problem is, is that once that, that Pandora's box is open and we're now letting people out early, we've now changed the rules for them. Um, we don't have the gumption down at the state capitol to say, hey, once again, we did something wrong. We need to come back and clamp down on this. Um, you know, we've learned a lot about how people can be re rehabilitated, um, but it doesn't apply to everybody. And so it, it's, it needs more work and more research into you know, when it is we start making concessions for people getting out of prison and going out and committing crimes. Kathy. Um, thank you. And yeah, I don't think anybody denies that we need to do more work. And I think we as um, a country and nation have more work to do. Um, some of the things that we've been working on in our state legislature are getting rid of private prisons or so for-profit prisons, which have... Um, no incentive to to get people out of prison and to make sure that they are have job skills, have education when they leave. Um, we've been doing things like um, we we passed a bill, I think it was last year, regarding prison phone calls. Did you know that prison phone calls are just one form that they use to get money out of people who are in prison? So they they give them very low pay for working in prison, and then they charge them a lot of money for things like toiletries or phone calls, etc. That's not how you behave or treat people when you want to, to rehabilitate them. We have um, more work to do. There's a long way to go. But again, we don't want our prisons to be warehouses for people who have mental or um, substance abuse issues. Thank you. And Dee Dee. Thank you so much. I appreciate the question. Um, our criminal system, criminal justice system does need to have a lot of reform. And one of the things we need to do is we need to respect the people who work within our prison system and we need to pay them appropriately so that they don't leave. We're short staffed in prisons right now. So we have a lot of issues within prisons because we don't have appropriate staffing. We all absolutely need to pay attention to mental health issues. Many, many of our incarcerated inmates have severe mental health issues and they need to be dealt with. There needs to be some kind of streamlining so that we can figure out how to deal with those issues while they're in prison serving their time. They still need to serve their time. That is an important component of criminal justice reform. As Representative Lynch said, we're giving the rewards before the, the sentence has been served, and that is an issue. Drug addiction is also an issue. It takes 18 to 24 months for the brain to reprogram itself if you have an opioid addiction. If we are releasing criminals before that time, three years is the magic number, if we release criminals before that time, they have not come off of those drugs, they come out still addicted, they're still looking for drugs, and we still have a problem. It solves nothing. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, and one more question on uh, <clears throat> uh, public safety. Uh, and we're going to start this time with Mike. What would you do to address public safety staffing shortages? Well, that's 
become pretty big issue. And, and part of that is because we have, uh, we've in effect made it that we don't have respect for our law enforcement. Um, somehow we've painted them as the bad guys because we're, we're tending to, to work so hard for that rehabilitation piece that we just, just talked about that we've, uh, we forgot that we need to, uh, to, to, to prop those folks up. Uh, that has come through legislation that takes away their immunity. It's, it's come from, um, uh, in, in, in funding cases, we, we've literally voted down on the floor uh, some pay raises for Colorado State Patrol. Uh, we had some opportunities to, to do that. Um, we've got to take care of those guys um, and, and make that job appealing to them and, and let them know that they're respected and they're, uh, that we've got their back with the, with the legislation that we put forward. Okay, Kathy. Um, thank you. Yeah, so let, let's uh, maybe start with the state level. So at the state level, we need to make sure that we treat our employees with dignity and respect and actually pay them. We have a pretty high vacancy rate in our state overall, including in the Department of Corrections, um, where we need to make sure that we have more people who are working in these jobs because there's all kinds of domino effects that show up when you have a 25% um, vacancy rate in your, um, with your employees. Um, I think prisons are another, uh, well, that's the prison area. The, div the police officer is another area. I do have a bill that I'm working on for this next year, which would allow us to get more police officers and a more diverse police force by allowing people who are DACA recipients to become post-certified, which is what you have to become to become a police officer. And yes, we do need to keep people with dignity and respect, but that's a two-way street. And by opening up the diversity, increasing the diversity, I think we can do this. Okay. Lisa. I mean, Dee Dee, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, Ruth. I understand. <laughs> um, and thank you for making me smile, because this is an issue that, that doesn't make me smile. This is an issue that really hits close to home for me. Last winter, <clears throat> my daughter was stranded on a highway road. It was 14 degrees outside. It was dark. There were trucks just screaming by. There was no shoulder. She couldn't stay in the car because there was a chance that someone would hit the car because it was stuck in the lane of traffic. She weighs 98 pounds. She didn't have a winter coat. It was 14 degrees outside. She had to wait two and a half hours for someone to come rescue her. I was on the phone with 911. Her father, who was on a business trip, was on the phone with 911, calling and calling and calling. We couldn't get anyone from the Highway State Patrol because they were so understaffed, they were dealing with other issues. My daughter could have died last year because of this Law Enforcement Integrity Act that my opponent voted for that demoralizes our public safety officers. They are fleeing the field. Boulder 911 is about running at about 50%. Imagine if your child is in danger and it takes two and a half hours to get a responder to your house. It's not okay. We have to revisit this legislation and change it. Lisa. <laughs> Well, first and foremost, I want to say we're very fortunate if you live in Larimer County under the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. I believe they have two vacancies right now. So in northern Colorado, we're very fortunate. And as someone who uses their services in Wellington, I am very grateful. Um, I do think that it's important that we are paying our law enforcement who put their lives on the line every day to protect us at an appropriate level. Competitive pay is a thing. If we're not paying at a competitive level, then we are either getting people nobody else wants or people who have no experience or no people at all. So we definitely need to look at that and make that a priority. I think it's not really any different than when we're talking about teachers who get to mold the minds of our youngest uh, residents and citizens in the state. So I, if I am elected, will work very hard to make sure that all of our state officers are receiving a fair and very competitive livable wage. Okay, thank you. Um, let's switch to a new theme. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about education. And st we'll start this around with Kathy. How do you propose we, provi we provide more support at the state level for our education system? 
So um, Colorado has some real challenges when it comes to funding education. And, um, well, I'm just going to bring the, up the elephant in the room because we haven't even talked about it yet, but that's Tabor. Tabor actually keeps us from being able to keep the revenue that the, the taxes that our citizens pay so that we can have good schools and good roads. But instead, we are, are having to make very tough choices like not adequately paying so we don't have enough people working for the state right now not paying teachers well for education. Um, our teacher pay rate in Colorado is amongst the worst in the entire country when it's compared. So we have a lot of work to do. Honestly, I think it's going to eventually take a referendum. I will say we've done a lot of work over the last four years. Uh, free all-day kindergarten. We have um, next year free universal pre-K for 10 hours a week for four-year-olds. We have um, made some tweaks to funding our special education students are, um, and we've done some other, and too complicated to explain the short time frame tweaks. Happy to talk more. Okay, Davy. Thank you so much. As a former teacher and assistant principal, this is an issue that is really near and dear to my heart. We have to provide more support to our to our schools. The, t the money is not making it to the teachers and it is not making it to the students. It is making it to administration and administrative bloat for programs that encourage non-academic subjects being taught in our schools. We really need a paradigm shift here. We have got to shift away from non-academic subjects back to academic subjects, making sure that that money is not going to administrative bloat when student enrollment has remained flat or has even decreased. It should be going to the teachers and it should be going to the students. And we can do that without raising taxes and without messing with the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. We absolutely can do that. In regards to curriculum, we're making a lot of curriculum decisions at the state level. Again, that takes money. If we stop making those decisions at the state level and start making them at the local level where they belong, local school boards should be making curriculum decisions. Parents should be making curriculum decisions. Parents make the best decisions for their children in collaboration with their local school boards. And that will save money and get money to the teachers, to the classrooms where it belongs. Thank you. And Lisa? So as I mentioned in my introduction, I sit on the Budget Advisory Committee for Poudre School District, and I've been on that committee for eight or nine, I'm going on nine years now. So I have watched the fluctuation in how the state funds education. And I think that we need to fully fund, the ed fu fully fund education. Um, no more negative factor. We need to pay what we need to pay, what the voters voted for, um, as far as the levels. Right now, we're just a little over $9,000 per student. Um, we are fortunate in PSD that we pass a mill levy that increases teacher pay to a competitive salary. We do pay higher than a lot of other school districts, but on a state level, this just needs to be a priority. We need to be prioritizing our children. We don't need to be fighting about school of choice and charter schools and things of that nature. We need to be fighting for our kids, fully funding education, and finding places to cut that funding elsewhere that isn't law enforcement. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and Mike. Uh, you know, we're fortunate in this state in that this is one of the few states in the nation that actually constitutionally demands that we fund education. Um, and money is not the issue. What, what we're seeing uh, really through, like even COVID really accentuated this, the, 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 the rise of charter schools were, my kids go to a school here in town that is not funded any greater than anywhere else, and it's the number one school in the state for SATs, uh, usually ranked very highly in, you know, in the top five in this state. That's not because they have more money. That's because they um, have more choice there, at the, the administration down at the, the school level. Um, I think we need to have a voucher system and let that money go to wherever those inner city kids that are stuck in a bad school want to go where their parents can say i want better for my child i'm going to let them go to a school i'm going to take my money if we do that and we manage it like a business i think we'll get great results thank you <clears throat> let's take a look at a couple of the ballot issues that we'll uh, be looking at this year and <clears throat> let's start this round with Dee. Dee. Um, if proposition 121 passes lowering the state income tax rate from 4.55% to 4.40%, how would the state deal with the reduced amount of revenue?
Well, let me say right off the bat as a taxpayer here in Laramie County and in the state of Colorado, I am a fan of reducing the income state, the income tax here in our state. How do we deal with that when it comes to funding our programs? That's a great, great question. We deal with that by looking at where we're spending our money, where we're wasting our money, how to save money, and how to put that money back into the pockets of taxpayers. There's a lot of waste in our government. There's a lot of waste in all government. I'm not blaming anyone in particular. It's just one of the sad repercussions of, of government is it's really easy to waste money when it's not your own. And I'm really looking forward to digging into the budget, seeing where the money's going, seeing how we can divert those funds so that we can reduce the income tax and we can protect the quality of life here for all Coloradans. It is critical that Coloradans have their money so they can pump it back into the economy. Right now, affordability is killing us all over the place, as I said in my opening remarks. And in order to make things more affordable, we have to make sure that we keep our money. And we can do that by reducing administrative bloat and bureaucracy spending, bureaucratic spending that's unnecessary. Thank you. Lisa? So while I am definitely all for saving money, um, for working families such as mine, that will save us approximately $7 a month. It's $87 on average for people in um, middle class, or it's probably lower middle class these days. I'm not even sure. Um, but what it will do is take, I believe, over $300 million out of the budget. When we're just talking about not being able to fully fund education, I'm not sure where we find another $300 million. So that means we're going to start seeing services cut, essential services. We're certainly not going to be able to pay our law enforcement more. We're not going to be able to improve public safety or programs to help get fentanyl off the street or any of the other important issues in our state because I needed an extra $7 a month out of my income tax. I don't think that that's an appropriate choice for Colorado right now. And Mike. Shockingly, I discovered that you can spend $300 million in this state in about uh, 30 seconds and when it's down at the state capitol. Um, lowering the tax rate um, it does not necessarily directly equate to us having less money in the state budget. Um, if we're putting more money into the economy, this is kind of economics 101, we have the opportunity to have more revenue and, and tax more revenue, even though it may be at a, at a lower rate. Um, so, you know, I, I am definitely for us reducing that. I'd like for us to reduce it more. Um, look around us at states that have incredibly lower rates. They don't have, they don't have budget issues because we, we have, not taking the money from the, the, the people. So I'm definitely in favor of 121. Okay. And Kathy? Wow. Okay. Um, this is a really big question. So first of all, I'm going to tell you, please vote against 121. We have very little funding at the state level for the state that we have. If you want to have people to be employed in our state, if you want to have worth funding for education, go ahead and vote for it. If you want to, I mean, oh my gosh, I'm, it's just making my head explode. Cutting the tax rate is a permanent solution to a temporary issue. There's something called the Tabor cap. The Tabor cap sits here. Any money that's above that, we have to give back to people right now. So if you read the argument in the blue book, it basically says, well, let's go ahead and um, just make this a permanent fix. That's what they did in the late 1990s. They lowered the tax rate permanently. And that led to huge problems down the road. Um, where would we cut money? Um, that was a question. Uh, we would do more deferred maintenance. We would not give our employees raises. We would um, stop funding even more of higher ed. It's a problem. Thank you. This is another question about a ballot issue. <clears throat> and we're going to start this time with Lisa. Please give your opinion of Proposition 123 that would dedicate one-tenth of a percent of income tax revenues for affordable housing programs. So I spent a lot of time looking at this because affordability is the number one issue that I want to address when I'm elected. Um, I think it's a great first step, if I'm being honest. It, a pro it will provide avenues for first-time homeowners, it will provide avenues for um, income-restricted homes and rents, 
And right now with um, the struggles that people are facing and rising gas prices and things like that, um, it's important that we give avenues to um, Coloradoans to be able to have something as simple as housing security. I think, as I said, I think it's a great first step. I think it's a, a step we can build on to improve other avenues for uh, policy changes that will open up the doors for our young Coloradoans as they go off into adulthood who right now are facing the choice of moving to maybe Wyoming or some other state because Colorado is simply too expensive right now. Thanks, Lisa. Mike? So in this last session, uh, there was a package of about four bills. I was the prime sponsor of one of them that, that addresses affordable housing. My, my particular bill gave incentives to the modular home uh, builders across the state. Um, there are other measures that we went through this year that we haven't even given a chance to, to, to get into effect. Um, the concept of the government's uh, supplying housing um, really doesn't make a lot of sense to me because it, it, in my beliefs, that's not the government's role. Um, the government should allow and provide for you the, the method and uh, uh, reduce the, the hindrances for you to go out and make a living. And, and, and if that doesn't work, then you have to adapt and figure it out. And um, it's not our responsibility, it's not my responsibility when I have worked my butt off to make sure that the person that um, has not and has not been responsible and taken the right actions uh, are going to be dependent upon my income. Thank you. Kathy? Uh, thank you. So, um, yes, I 100% of support um, Initiative 123 um, to help better fund affordable housing in Colorado. When we had that pan pandemic money coming from the federal level, we did put it into three large buckets. Those buckets were behavioral health, as we've talked about, affordable housing and homelessness. The last bucket was economic recovery and workforce development. Those are really all important areas to Colorado. I had two bills in the affordable housing space this year myself, but that is not totally meeting the need. We need to do all of the above solutions that are going to help us address the affordable housing crisis that we have throughout our state. Because what we have is we have a supply and demand problem. Supply and demand, that's basic economics, right? We have very little supply, so we have a lot of demand, which drives the prices up. We need to figure out how to get more housing that's affordable for people and not just big build big luxury mansions so that we have more affordable housing and bring down the prices. Thank you, and Dee Dee. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, house, housing prices in Colorado are, are astronomical. I can't believe how much they've increased just over the the last few years. It's it's insane. I'm, I'm glad my property is worth a lot more, but boy, it hurts first time buyers. Proposition one, two, three, while I appreciate that it does not increase taxes, it does put an undue burden on local municipalities to make up the differences from that. And I'm not sure that that is the best idea to put undue burdens on our cities and municipalities as we're entering into a recession. I think there are other options that we can turn to for affordable housing. First of all, if we re remove the regulations that make housing so expensive, then we can bring the cost of housing down. We can also revisit the bills that have, like that transportation bill that has terribly increased taxes and fees unfairly on our citizens and put that money back into their pocket so that they can actually afford somewhere to live. We have to work on affordability, affordable food, affordable health care access, affordable housing, all of it. And Pro Proposition 123 right now does not do that for us. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to um, switch to a new topic uh, on the environment. And this, uh, we'll, we'll start with you, Mike, this time. What measures do you support to help prevent and mitigate the effects of wildfires and floods in Colorado? Very appropriate. I sit on the interim committee on wildfires, so I've been, um, I, I can tell you about a bill that's going to be introduced um, coming up here. So there's a lot we can do. I mean, so my district, my, my what is my current district, was incredibly impacted by uh, Cameron Peak Fire. Um, it, one of, one of the bills that I'm proposing allows for and brings back and encourages the uh, timber industry. We we have ran that industry completely out of this state. There used to be hundreds of sawmills. Now there's you know a, around a dozen that can actually have any sort of volume. 
what that does for us, it, it's called it's called forest management, and we've kind of walked away from doing that um, from uh, for some ideological purposes. But the the ramification of that is we no longer have uh, clear cuts. We don't have logging roads. We don't have any way to fight fires if they come. But if the fires do come, we now have mitigated that and also created um, an industry for this state. And that's a bill that um, I've worked up already. Kathy. Um, thank you. Yes, that's an area, wildfire mitigation um, has been a really huge area where we've put lots of state resources into. We've got a new firefighting hel helicopter. We put money into um, watershed restoration so that we can let have those big floods coming down after a fire and taking everything out. Um, but we really also need to address the root of what is causing these larger and larger environmental disasters, and that is climate change. So we have also taken a lot of steps at the state level to mitigate climate change. We are trying to reduce energy usage. We're trying to, um, um, sorry, uh, I've got I've had a couple of bills on um, building at codes and um, housing, building housing codes to, so that we can have more efficient residences. And we, when we have more efficient places for people to live and to work in, we are also making sure that those are cheaper long term for them to live in. My time is up. Okay. And Dee Dee. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I, this is an important issue, especially given you know the Thompson flood that we had several years ago, the the recent Cameron Peak fires, other fires that have destroyed uh, hundreds and hundreds of acres here in northern Colorado. It's really tragic. Preparedness, I think, is a really important issue. We need to work on our infrastructure, infrastructure for our dams when it comes to flooding, infrastructure in all kinds of areas so that we can make sure that the floodwaters recede, that they have somewhere to drain, that the water has somewhere to go. So infrastructure is a really big part of that. We also have to pay attention to our first responders, as I said before. We need to make sure that we have people available in case there are emergencies to respond and to help people in need. We have to respect our firefighters. We have to respect our public safety officers. Very important. Um, forest management is huge. My mother lives um, right backed up to a natural space in Carbondale, and they're always worried about forest fires coming to the area and they invest heavily in forest management on their properties. Um, so these are just a few of the things that we can do to mitigate the issues, but we have to take it very seriously. Thank you. Okay, and Lisa. So as someone that's lived in Colorado for over 50 years, we'll leave it at that. Um, definitely seen how our climate has changed. It's much drier now. Um, the wildfires just in the 16 years I've been in northern Colorado have been horrific. That is because it's been very dry. We've had a lack of precipitation. We're in a terrible drought. Um, and environmental factors, um, man-made and natural. Um, I think it's important that as we see more people flock to our state, that we need to be informing them of what mitigation looks like in and around your home, especially if you choose to live in the foothills. I also think that we need to be responsible about the building codes that we're putting forth. Um, I know there's a lot of improvements for energy efficiency, but we still have setbacks that are like this big in northern Colorado. I'm very grateful that it isn't that way in the town of Wellington, but we need to improve our setbacks so that we don't think see um, future events like Louisville and Superior. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I have another question regarding the environment, and we'll start this time with Kathy. What one environmental issue is most important for the future of Colorado? And what ideas do you have for addressing this issue? Um, thank you. So I think that renewable energy is one of those things that we have been working really hard in Colorado to improve. So things like solar power and wind power, um, electric vehicles, just all of these things together to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels because fossil fuels are not only a finite resource, they create lots of um, methane and other pollution which lead to our climate continuing to worse because methane is actually worse, like what, 76 times worse or something than all these other gases that are out there. So we really need to make sure, and I guess that's not one answer, that's several, but it's, they all interplay with one another. We need to become less dependent on fossil fuels. We need to work on solutions that are getting rid of um, things like coal plants and reliance on gasoline as much as we can. 
and Dee Dee. Thank you. That is an important question. So many things in, involved in environmental issues, and I don't know that one is more important than the other, but one that really strikes me and hits accords with me is water. Water is a huge issue here in Colorado, and it is, it is vital that we have clean, safe drinking water here in Colorado. And I think the way that we do this is we work on conservation. We work on right-sizing our storage for water. Our population is expected to double by 2050, so making sure we're right-sizing our water storage is really, really critical. And we need to make sure that we're mitigating environmental impacts that come with any future water projects here in northern Colorado, and I know that we are prepared to do that. I'm glad that we're taking a look at this issue. I'm glad that we're looking at water. Um, providing clean water for Coloradans is essential to our quality of life and our health. Thank you. And Lisa. So first, I would agree with everything that both Kathy and Dee Dee said. Um, water is a big issue. The Colorado River Basin is in a crisis. It's losing uh, depth and flow just through heat loss. So that's something that we definitely need to address, protecting our watersheds. Um, in addition, I think it's um, this is going to be a little off the beaten path, but solar panels are like the up and coming thing up here in northern Colorado all the time. At least in Wellington, I see them a lot. But I would like to see us pass some policy and legislation that puts the recycling of those solar panels back in the hands of the manufacturers that are selling them to our residents. Right now, there isn't a very efficient way to do that, and the cost is uh, put upon the people that purchase those solar panels and um, they only have a shelf life of about 20 to 25 years. So eventually we're gonna have a huge solar panel problem and I would like to see us address that as well. Uh, renewables are very important, recycling is very important and I think we need to look at some of the smaller items that will play into this in the future. And Mike. I hate to do this to you but I read that I could. Could you repeat the question because we kind of went Certainly. everywhere. <laughs> what one environmental issue is most critical for the future of Colorado, and what ideas do you have for addressing this issue? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to agree. It's, it's definitely water, um, we, it, and we've got a real struggle going on right now with the urban and rural parts of the state where uh, we're buying up and drying up uh, uh, farmlands and to, to feed the cities and and then at some point we're gonna we're gonna run into a real issue where we turn around and go uh, we don't have any food um, so, so water is by far the I think our biggest environmental issue uh, on other environmental issues though I, I'm encouraged with the um, after touring the, the rawhide plant and we're 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 able to make some of these changes in our state and in our world but we're in too big a hurry to do it. Um, so in my talk with the, the Rawhide folks, they're gonna make that transition, but we need to be able to not rigidly legislate that you must make this transition at this period in time and not have some, um, uh, some leeway that we can run a, a power plant on natural gas, which is pretty clean for a while if we need to. Okay, okay we're going to uh, <clears throat> kind of follow along the same theme, but talk a little bit about growth and infrastructure. And let's start this question with Dee Dee. Considering the continued growth on our, in Northern Colorado, how would you address infrastructure needs going forward? Well, as we continue to grow, we're absolutely going to have to adjust our infrastructure needs going forward. I think one of our biggest and most concerning infrastructure needs concerns our roads. And we've heard the governor say it. We need to fix our, insert expletive here, roads. And we, we do. We passed a monstrous bill, the transportation bill recently, to address the needs of infrastructure, especially with our roads, except that it doesn't really address the needs of our roads. It taxes us to death. It takes money out of Colorado's pockets, and it doesn't put money towards infrastructure. So if we're going to pass, pass bills that are supposed to go towards infrastructure, they need to. And these, this bill is packed with fees. We call them fees, not taxes. They're really taxes. It circumvents the taxpayer bill of rights, and we need to put this to the taxpayers and let the taxpayers decide how they collect the money and how that money will be used to fix our roads. And we need to make sure the money goes to our roads because right now, it's not going to our roads. Thank you. Okay, Lisa. 
Growth and in infrastructure is pretty much all of House District 65. It's comprised of many small towns that have seen massive growth with little to no uh, support for infrastructure improvements. Uh, the town of Wellington is currently under $80 million in debt to improve water treatment and wastewater treatment facilities um, being taxed to 11,000 people. Um, right now, that is one of the reasons why I'm running, is because towns like Severance and Timnath and Windsor and Eaton and Wellington, they're all seeing this incredible growth with no real infrastructure. We have a brand new highway that's being, ex well, not a brand new highway, but a highway that's being expanded and it stops at Mulberry. Yet we have massive growth that goes all the way up past Wellington and we're not fully addressing, we need to start being proactive rather than reactive with the growth and the infrastructure in Northern Colorado. Thank you. And Mike. Thank you, you finally found a topic where I'm willing to spend money for the state. Um, <laughs> Infrastructure is, is part of what I feel is, is the role of, of government. And that's, that's why we take in taxes so that you can have something that you cannot build on your own, like a sewer system, like a road, like an electrical grid. Um, I am all for us focusing on infrastructure spending. However, it doesn't need to be some of these ideological infrastructure spending where we're gonna now make electric school buses we're going to um, tack out, task out our grid with uh, electric car chargers when folks that live in the most urban parts of the state cannot uh, even afford one or find a charger. Um, we need to focus our legislation on what is really needed at the community level and infrastructure is, is, is where we start. Okay, and Kathy. Um, thank you. Yeah, I was proud to support that infrastructure bill last year, the transportation bill, which was a huge compromise, which is, I believe, going to help us get to where we need to go. People say, well, we don't want to, you know, t pay fees or whatever for our our transportation infrastructure. We need to do that. We also need to have more public transportation. We need to make sure that we're not impacting our most marginalized communities. We need to make sure that as we're developing our infrastructure that we're also working on population density and infill because that's got to be part of the solution as we continue to grow. Um, the housing market we've already talked about. One of the things we haven't talked about um, in terms of affordable housing is uh, metro districts. Metro districts are a huge uh, issue that show up every single year that we have to have to pay for the infrastructure in neighborhoods because municipalities and uh, local jurisdictions no longer have the re revenue to do that because again, Tabor, we need to stop taking away um, the ability to sustainably maintain what we already have. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna change subjects again. And this time we're starting with Lisa. How would you address the issues of news deserts where citizens have no access to local news? Well, I guess that would depend on whether or not they really want to read the news. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, well, I'm just saying, right? Like, it's such a hot topic, right? Um, well, one of the things that I would really like to see is see some uh, journalism really kind of coming back. I Maybe I'm just old, but I really miss the Rocky Mountain news. Um, I would really like to see the opportunity for our young people to learn what journalism looks like and maybe we start passing some policies and I know grants means money, but this is that thing about prioritizing things where we can start producing that type of uh, information source for our more rural communities, for our older uh, citizens that may not want to be on the internet or don't have access to internet or can't afford internet. There's some creative solutions there and I think that's really where we need to start going and start thinking outside the box of how do we serve those in our community that aren't on Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or whatever. Okay, Mike. Well, thank you for educating me on a new term. 
I've never heard of a news desert. So, I, I, <laughs> but, but however, I believe I live in one because I get the paper delivered every day, but then that just stops. So then no longer can I get the Reporter Herald delivered to Wellington or the Colorado. And so I guess I live in a news desert. I'm dealing with this traumatic event. Um, you know, the internet has so taken over um, what's going on in our world uh, that that news news is not what news used to be. We used to have reporters that went out and reported it. Now, now individual citizens and individuals go, and uh, they they make their own their own news. Um, you know, if you want to reduce a news desert, I guess we need to make sure we have Wi-Fi all over the place, and um, and uh, we're we're doing a lot to go in in that direction. But I miss the old newspaper that I I put to good use for various things, and, and I read it every now and then too. So, Kathy. So I, I really think that part of what we are facing is that people tend to believe in different sets of facts. And people are getting their information from places that aren't necessarily reliable. One of the things that we did last year in the legislature is we passed a bill um, to work on media literacy in our schools. Because if you can't tell the difference between what real facts are and whatever um, crazy link you might find on the um, internet, you're going to have trouble believing maybe your local newspaper, right? So until we can figure out how to give people common ground, common sense of facts, I think you're going to have trouble with people even being willing to rely on local news and local newspapers. So I think we've got a lot of work to do to get to the root of that issue. And Dee Dee. Thank you very much. Like Mike, this was a new term for me, news desert. So thank you for the education this evening. I think private enterprise is really critical when it comes to bringing news to our rural areas. And, and Mike, maybe your son can um, start interviewing people at the Reporter Herald and the Associated Press and start his own newspaper for your area. That would be one solution is just to get the citizens and the community involved. I think that the citizens of Colorado are very creative and very innovative, and they can come up with ways to provide their communities with accurate informative news other than Twitter. Twitter is not news. Um, just so we are all on the same page. <laughs> uh, and again, we need to make sure that our rural areas our rural areas do have access to internet and they do have access to Wi-Fi so that they can they can access electronic versions of the newspapers that they're no longer getting in paper format. Thank you. Okay, we're going to um, uh, switch tempo here, uh, and I'd like to do a lightning round. That means that uh, you'll have, uh, well, usually just one word to, do, to answer the question. We're going to start this with Mike, and we'll keep that same order going forward for the next three questions. So, Mike, give one word that describes your leadership style. Compassionate. Kathy. Representative. Dee Dee. Transformational. And Lisa. I don't have a word. I'm willing to do more work than them, so I don't know what that word is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and again with Mike, Colorado's elections, including mail ballots, are safe and secure. Agree or disagree? Agree. Kathy? Agree. Dee Dee? Agree. And Lisa? Agree. Okay. D and this, uh, we're back at Mike. Do you believe inequities exist for people of color regarding employment, housing, and health care? Yes or no? Yes. Kathy. Yes. Inequities and inequalities. Yes. And Lisa? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's see. We're back to Kathy again. <clears throat> Kathy, if elected, what will your top three priorities be and why? 
That's a really good question. Um, well, definitely the first one is public education. We need to work on public education funding for all levels. And um, yes, money does matter when it comes to education. Teachers don't work for free. And that 85% of your average school budget is people, right? Schools are people businesses. You just can't get around that. Um, let's see, other issues are health care, including behavioral health care, and that's access and affordability. Um, climate change is another one, and I'm going to throw in a fourth, which is affordable housing, but I think the, they all deserve a prominent place because they're all critical to Colorado and our future. Thank you. Dee Dee. Thank you. Um, as I said in my opening statements, I think I listed my priorities there for everyone. My top priorities are, of course, public safety. Crime is running rampant in Colorado, and we have to get a handle on that so that our citizens feel safe. They are protected. Criminals are held accountable for their actions, and law-abiding citizens are safe to walk the streets. Affordability and protections for small businesses, they to kind of go hand in hand, I'm talking about reducing taxes and fees, getting money back into the hands of the taxpayers and reducing overregulation for small businesses, and especially the housing industry, so that we do increase affordability for the citizens here in Colorado. And last but not least, public education is a huge concern for me, both academics and parents having the right to choose how and where their children are educated. Parents are the predominant person in a child's life, and they have the responsibility to make sure that their children are educated in the way that serves them the best. Thank you. Lisa? My top three priorities are going to be focused on um, entire communities and specifically working families. Um, public education is certainly my number one priority. Um, and while I do think that families do have a choice right now, uh, working families don't necessarily have the ability and the, uh, the funds to drive their children to school. Um, often in other cities. So I think it's important that we're continuing to invest in public education so that we're not sidelining families. Also, affordability, that's housing, that's food, that's gas. I've been the person who's had the count change to put gas in my car. I know that struggle, and I think that fighting for real affordable solutions is very, very important. And then finally, infrastructure and water and the cost that is associated with that in the municipalities that I would be representing. And Mike. Well, it looks like a lot of us are on the same page, but um, s safety is, is, I think, in crime our number one issue right now because you can't, you can't do much if you don't feel safe in your community. Um, and that is the number one role in my mind of, of our government and that is the number one role of being in this position is that you make sure that your your citizens are safe and and our crime rate is absolutely ridiculous um, the affordability issues in this state are would be number two our, our lack of being able to actually keep what we earn uh, that is uh, causing a lot of problems and um, and then education once we've talked about that uh, I believe that, that the individuals in this state should have a choice with their child on where they go to school and how they're educated um, and turn that over to the free market. Let's, let's determine which the best schools are by, by giving people choice. And then, of course, infrastructure, because if you've ever driven to Wellington, that road really stinks. Okay. Uh, our time is coming to a close. So I'd like to ask each of the candidates to make a closing statement, lasting one minute each. And we'll start with Dee Dee. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ruth, so much. You're a fantastic moderator. I really enjoyed this time and, and listening to everyone and talking. It would have been nice to have a two-way conversation. So hopefully afterwards, we can have a two-way conversation in the lobby. My goal is to protect the quality of life of all Coloradans. And what that means, basically, is we need to get a handle on crime. If we don't tackle crime, nothing else matters. We have to feel safe walking on our streets, and we have to make sure that our citizens aren't paying the price for criminals not paying the price. We need to address affordability in our state. We need to reduce unnecessary taxes and fees so that our citizens can afford to put gas in their car, food on the table. No one should have to make a decision to choose between one of those two things. And we need to make sure that our small businesses are free to operate, free from government overreach and overregulation, so that they can thrive and 
and grow and bring jobs to Northern Colorado and support the economy. We want a vibrant, robust economy here. And again, public education, the focus on academics and allowing parents to decide where and how their children are educated. They are the ultimate authority in a child's life and we should not ever circumvent that authority. Thank you. And Lisa. I think it's important to stress that, yes, I listed out my priorities, but my number one priority, what I really should have said, is that I'm running to actually advocate for the citizens within my district to be their voice. Um, I have been doing that in my town, and I think it's time that I take those same skills to the state. I think Northern Colorado, and specifically these municipalities, haven't had a real voice and a real advocate yet. Um, I think it's important for working families to be represented. I think it's important for families not to be marginalized because they don't have the means or the ways to do some of the things that um, some of the other people up here are talking about in terms of policy changes. Um, I want to make sure that people can afford to feed their children, their children can get a good education at their community school where neighbors watch out for neighbors and they're safe and they're taken care of, and they know they're well represented in the state capitol. Thank you, and Mike? Ruth, well, um, you're gonna get thanked a lot, but so thank you, this has been a great forum, um, and, and thank you guys for keeping this civil. I appreciate that, uh, nothing that got thrown, which is, which is what uh, is important in this process, um, and that I've discovered through my time down at the capitol, uh, is that uh, we may have different ideologies and, and views when we get down there, but at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we're doing what's right for the people of this state. Um, with that attitude, I was the number one uh, Republican for getting bills passed. So you can't get a bill passed down there without some of these Democrats helping you out. So um, I've proven that I um, can do this job. I've enjoyed this job. Um, I'm currently the, the ranking member on the business committee because, um, because they know I can get things done down there. So um, in, in one term, you can't really uh, get, get a whole lot done. So I, I look forward to having the momentum that I, that I bring um, to, to continue to do good things for Northern Colorado. Thank you. And Kathy. Um, thank you, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting today, and thank you to everybody who took the time to listen to all of this. I know that this is not, um, as it was stated, and not a two-way conversation, so um, don't hesitate ever to look me up. My, my personal cell phone is on my website. My email is on my website. You can give me a call. You can shoot me a text, www.kathykip.com. Actually, I think you can even leave out the Ws. Um, but I just want to say, you know, I, I spent seven years on the local school board followed up by four years in the state house. I really think I've done a good job of getting out there and listening. Um, since I've been in the house, we've had dozens of listening sessions. We keep people up to date with um, newsletters and uh, town forums or t uh, town halls and issue forums. We've done a lot to make sure that we're staying in touch with our community and listening to what you need. And um, you know, the job title is the exact same as the job description, which is representative. So I urge you to don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our candidates for being here tonight and sharing their thoughts with us. We greatly appreciate your participation tonight. Thank you also to the City of Fort Collins and their staff for allowing us to have this forum in the City Council Chambers tonight and for making it available to the public. Thank you to our League volunteers for keeping us on track and especially to Gwen Lipke who organizes these important civic, civic events. There will be an additional forum on October 12th for the Colorado State Senate District 15 and House District 49 candidates. Your ballots will be mailed out October 17th. Please be sure to return your ballots by 7 p.m. on Election Day, November 8th. Thank you all for being with us. Good night. <laughs>